Good evening, friends. Very good evening to all of you. I mean, from India, people who are from India, Bangladesh, and Nepal, I'll call you evening, but the others, of course, are in different time zones. Uh, anyway, uh, as uh, thank you for joining us for today's session. Uh, today's session, we are, I mean, as I said in my in our WhatsApp group, is gradually we would go into deep dive into the uh, sanitation value chain, and we start with the containment systems. The first part of the uh, sanitation value chain is a containment system. So today's module, we'll be talking about designing of on-site sanitation systems and speci specifically with reference to the containment systems. And for that, in the initial half an hour, we'd be talking about, or we would be learning about planning for sanitation, the on-site and off-site systems, the code of practices and the guidelines. And to do this, to enlighten us on these, on these factors, we have Mr. Rohit Kakkar with us. He is the advisor at the Ministry of Urban Development and Government of India, an ex-alumni of IIT Bombay. Having, uh, I mean, I won't waste much of time because it's a lot of things you would actually come to know and you would have, have a lot of, maybe you have a, lot, have a lot of queries to ask to Mr. Kakkar. So having, uh, not, in, not wasting much of time, I would hand it over to Mr. Kaka Rohit ji. Please take over the floor. Thank you so much for joining us. Are you there, sir? He is joined. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes. we can see you. Yeah, please take on, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, uh, I'm uh, from the Central Public Health and Environmental Engineering Organization sitting in Delhi. My name is Rohit Kakkar. I'm a deputy advisor here. And uh, at this moment, our organization, which is a part of the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, Government of India, we are uh, just one second. Okay, at this moment, uh, this organization is involved in the Swatch Bharat mission and under the Swatch Bharat mission, my uh, team is looking after the used water management component. How does the, the used water management uh, in India, in Indian context, in Indian urban areas is improved to meet the global standards and the uh, SDG guidelines. So we had done some planning. We have executed those planning. We have introduced the planning to the states and ultimately the uh, sanitation being a state subject, states are now being encouraged to take uh, the sanitation as per the, uh, as per the, you could say, the guidance of this ministry and central public health engineering organization. I can see that there are international uh, uh, participants out here. So maybe there are similar organizations in your uh, nation. So uh, I'll be covering my presentation, which I have is, will be around 30, 35 minutes and it will be in two parts. One is the basic engineering part of it. That is the science and engineering part of it. Why this entire trouble of, you know, getting the treatment and getting, managing this huge quantity of uh, used water is important. And second is what are the broad areas or broad uh, you could say directions in which uh, in india's uh, in india's context we are taking this uh, this program ahead so uh, without waste, wasting much time i'll just uh, like to open a presentation again just a sec mm. just give me a couple of minutes Okay, can you see this uh, uh, presentation? Can somebody? Yes, to? yes, yes, sir. We can see. And I'm trying to put it on full screen and then try to move. Sometimes this does not work. So I'm just asking you to just reconfirm. Now it's in full screen. Uh, no, no issue, yes. sir. We can pull up the slide. You can talk and ask us to change the slides. As I mean, when... we don't. No. We don't have the copy of it, sir. Yes. Uh -oh. I'll make the presentation. I'll move the presentation also. I'll just request you to confirm whether this 
full screen is there it's, no it's not full screen sir it's not full screen could you make it so please uh, pardon me because it always happens sometimes say you know uh, uh, this so i'll just keep moving the slides and uh, as i discuss oh okay. so, right sure <laughs> starting so uh, we all know why just one second again there's some important thing just give me a couple of minutes yeah, rajesh can you just take it on as from the joint secretary of office i'll just take this call and come back in the meantime uh sorry uh, i'm done okay right sure thank you let me continue i'm sorry again apologies there will be you know being in our office uh, this particular issue always comes up okay so so uh, first part i'll just just covering that why this need to treat as there why can't just we allow the water to you know just will uh, lost to the environment as was being done for uh, maybe many many years uh, before maybe 1850s and then we'll come to how this country in india we are thinking of how this entire thing needs to be treated finally and which is the most important part and because this presentation also goes to various uh, administrators so what to treat and what not to treat is basically a management approach because there are limitations of funds especially in, in our context in south asian countries in uh, if it's a developing nations the limitations of the other priorities also there so whatever the municipal uh, authorities need to uh, you know they their uh, prioritization has to be done if they expect, they have to first spell the need and then arrange the for the funds and then prioritize among the other competing requirements and then uh, you know take on this uh, part of their uh, responsibility so when we go to uh, you know these uh, administrators we try to tell them that number one element of this is the need for public health and we all know what is mpn so just to Uh, some of them uh, some of our participants also could be from the administration side so what i want to point out out here there are two major components of uh, how we look at pollution one is the impurities which are various kind of impurities in wastewater which are you know uh, solids are there various chemicals are there carbon oxygen nitrogen hydrogen sulfur phosphorus etc which impact color odor etc and we all know what are the typical uh, uh, concentrations of this the on the right hand side is a more important uh, element when we when we when we tell somebody okay my mpn is 100 10 raised to 7 per 100 ml what does it imply it actually implies it actually implies that on the tip of a pencil tip you could say there are 100 e coli line if you see this is you know around 1 uh, mm cube so on a 1 mm cube area almost 100 100 numbers of pathogens 10 to 2 that is 100 numbers of pathogens would be lying on that tip so that small quantity of used water which otherwise a person would feel it is okay it is smelling uh, we are actually discharging it into the environment the nature will take care of it so nature can take care of the the other component the bod component the other you know solids can be taken care of till a certain extent but this pathogen which has been introduced through our usage of this this waste water this becomes a major uh element and uh, globally in the developed nations it is well recognized that these are very very serious uh, issues and we have to make sure that this 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 element which has been introduced into water this gets removed as early as possible and we cannot allow the uh, nature to take its course one only one point point out from here that like if you take salmonella as a uh, as a micro uh, microorganism there would be around 350 to 300 units of this per ml and the, uh, as you can see on the uh, uh, right lower uh, this kind of a chart where we are trying to show that the requirement of pathogens is just log 1 that is 10 number of units is required to cause the introductory disease the dose dosage for infection is very low so many such uh, you know uh, microbes and very many such pathogens are in necessity of this treatment right this again is very uh, you could say verbose but coming back to that 198 sorry 1850 experiment which was done in uh, uh, london uh, at the bond street they were able to identify one mr john snow who carried out a statistical survey and he found out that the cause for cholera was a particular hand pump 
called the Broad Street Pump in London. And from this, they were able to, for the first time in history, note that pathogens are also a very important because prior to this, it was all, uh, you know, wastewater was only about smell and about, uh, you could say, dis uh, discomfort to the people in the surrounding. But nobody was in kind of uh, the uh, role of disease in this uh, bad water, which is only in 19, uh, sorry, 1850s that this experiment was conducted and we were able to find out. So now coming to, you know, if you take that ex example from uh, London in 1850, when the density of London was only around 4,200 people per square kilometer, and you, you can take it to any typical urban area in India and in other uh, South Asian countries, can we kind of relate to that, that what's the, uh, the, the kind of density which we, our people ha are living in, and the, especially in the slums and the, uh, you know, the congested area and the kind of environment where this, these pathogens are being released by our usage into our environment, uh, the short circuiting of this path, these disease causing pathogens back into the back into the people who are uh, living there, right? So this was one element. The second element, obviously, everybody knows, is a biochemical oxygen demand, which is again a uh, 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 unrequired element of uh, used water or wastewater in which uh, some quantity of, uh, of biochemical oxygen demand gets introduced into this water because of uh, uh, our usage. So now what I just want to point out out here is that, you know, when we say black water is very bad and gray water is, you know, generally okay, you have to see that as per all, uh, you could say records and all uh, scientific uh, studies, 70% of the BOD comes from our gray water that is the kitchen, bathing and washing area. And only around 30% of BOD comes from the black water, which is our uh, your toilet usages and urine. So we have to be very careful in saying that, okay, we only need to treat black water and we may not treat gray water, which is, you know, why I'm telling you this is because in recent years, while the, this country in India, we are trying to improve the quality of use water management. Often these, uh, uh, you know, statements are made and then uh, it becomes slightly difficult because everybody wants to uh, spend the least amount of funds for this uh, managing your used water. But uh, to do that, they try to differentiate between these two components of uh, uh, water. While gray water is much more in volume as compared to black water, but also, also the gray water carries 70% of the BOD load. So we have to make sure that in case we want to remove the BOD, the gray water also needs to be managed to the same level as Black water, that's the uh, point. Okay, there are various statistics coming from, uh, you know, even Western uh, countries or this particular slide is from Japan, which says the BOD uh, uh, per capita is around 43 grams, out of which uh, only about uh, 13 grams comes from the, uh, the night soil or the uh, excreta. The rest of it all is coming from the gray water. Our studies on and India also are corresponding to the same uh, requirement. Okay. So this was one, uh, two major reasons why to treat uh, use water because of the pollutants in that. And secondly, is a disease causing pollutants in uh, this thing. And finally, in case uh, uh, these two are not uh, found to be satisfactory or not found to be important enough by the, by the administrator, we can also say that if we use treat water, uh, if we treat our used water, we can introduce it for reuse. If you do not do that, because urban areas are a concentration, are densely packed concentration, people here often treat, uh, fresh water is brought in from huge distances. In India, in many cases, it comes from over 100 kilometers away. And after a single usage, in case you are just going to uh, discharge the water into environment without proper treatment, you, this may not be appropriate. While by doing only a small amount of, uh, uh, you could say, uh, improvement on that, we can use it for various uh, useful purposes, such as, as listed here, agriculture, power, or So these are the various reasons why this water needs to be treated. Then, okay. Second is how to treat, which is the major part. What is our, you know, our, in our planning, how do we, in India, we plan to uh, make this uh, uh, water fit for, uh, you could say, uh, discharge and for other uh, secondary usages. For this, there are engineering aspects involved into this, which we can divide into four components, collection, conveyance, treatment, and uh, if possible, 
reuse and all the all of these are important because all of them cost money and all of them are cost money and when the money is involved the decision making is affected by that so this is important so we already said uh, noted why this should be treated but what is to be treated is also known and how this is to be treated one just one point often what happens when uh, you know city administrators are, uh, are uh, they get uh, uh, you could say uh, the uh, the agencies which are into this uh, uh, you could say vendors come into this picture they only paint a very small or a partial picture of it whereas when cpho as an organization we <laughs> Uh, interact with the cities. We also tell them that you must make sure that the entire treatment train follows a certain pattern. One cannot just remove the pathogens without removing the BOD because of the it's not possible to chem chemically remove only the pathogens. We have, it will also the chemicals will also affect the BOD. So first step is that we have to remove the suspended solids. Only then the BOD can be uh, the if by, by BOD can be removed, and th after the BOD gets removed. So the pathogens can be tackled. So this is a sequence of removal which has to be followed in each and every treatment process, even if it is on site and a septic tank or in case of a full fledged treatment plant. So this sequence is very, very important because otherwise all these elements, all these impurities, they mutually interfere and uh, that becomes difficult to, uh, the pollutant is difficult to remove. <laughs> One interesting point which I would like to point out. See, while the need for good sanitation has been felt by the entire world throughout its history, especially after urbanization and after people started coming together and living in a closed environment. So all this problem of bad smell and other uh, you know, problems with sanitation were always felt. However, it was only in 1860 or 1870 for the first time a septic tank was invented. Whereas we all know that by 1820, the railways uh, were al already there in the, uh, uh, we could say that it has already been invented. Similarly, if we see the first commercial flight took, in, took, off, took off in 1914, but the first sea-based treatment plant, the activated sludge process was first time invented only in 1929. So while the need has been found, felt by the entire humanity for thousands of years, it has been very difficult and with great uh, amount of its application of mind, people have been able to invent certain uh, uh, features which need to be uh, now introduced to the ground. So there cannot be too much of playing around with it. So there are, you know, like when we say, when we discuss an on-site system, a septic tank system or any other system, we have to make sure that what is the in intended, uh, you could say, its uh, purpose that gets uh, fulfilled. So uh, if we uh, get to the next uh, slide, in our uh, uh, knowledge as, when, uh, as far as the CPHA is concerned, we find that you know there could be n number of uh, sanitation approaches, but typically the on-site and off-site can be divided into these, uh, as, as can be seen on this slide, around 15 to 20 different uh, methods. So uh, the on-site basically is, you can say, uh, the most uh, prevalent is the septic tank with a uh, poor flush uh, uh, system followed by a soak well. There are other uh, issues like single pits and uh, uh, VIP latrines. And then on-site systems could be a full-fledged treatment plant like in Japan, they have the Jakasu. There are other inventors also across the world. On off-site systems, sewerage could be combined, separated, or they could, could be in, in a non-conventional manner like the small bore system or a simplified system. So these are the various, you could say, broad groups of sanitation which are uh, prevalent in the world. In India, for the for the uh, you know for the ongoing missions like Swat Bharat mission, <laughs> as well as Amrut, we generally uh, have been asking the states to stick to three or four well-established systems, which could be that we can have a sewer system, which could be a, uh, ideally it should be a separated sewer, but it could be a combined sewer. On the other hand, uh, we can have an on-site system, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, which will be a septic tank, which will be followed by a soak pit. So the system has to be a two-part system, a septic a soak pit. So these could be the systems, or they can be a twin pit system, in which is uh, as per the, uh, you know, that six monthly uh, 
you, you use one pit and then uh, block this uh, approach to the pit and then use the other pit. So these are three, four systems. Besides this, we are also, uh, you could say in India, we also support uh, on-site full-fledged treatment systems like the CASU or any other full-fledged wastewater treatment system, which uh, you know takes care of all the pollutants, that is the suspended solids, the organic matter, the BOD, as well as the pathogens. So if a system has got the uh, components which takes care of all the systems, we are uh, we support those kind of uh, introductions. Only problem is that such systems are slightly, uh, in fact, much more costly than uh, a sewage system or, or an on-site uh, septic tank um, so well system. So it, uh, the usage is slightly limited in the country. Right. The off-site systems which we have, like we said, that uh, consist of sewers with a, a sewage pumping stations and sewage treatment plants. And the advantage of such good systems is that it collects all the used water, be it the gray water, your black water, everything gets collected from your uh, point of use and it is safely conveyed to a treatment facility, not through a open drain, which can you know, cause uh, secondary disease. If it is safely conveyed through sewers, out at the treatment plant, it is treated to the desired level as per the regulations. And in case we can have a you know, slightly larger treatment plant, there'll be always a economy of scale in the treatment. On the other hand side, dependent, dependent on the dispersal of the town, uh, with the cost of sewers could increase for a larger plant. So that uh, appropriate size of the treatment facility has to be uh, seen by the uh, local authority. At the same time, when you have this kind of a system, the local authority <coughs> has to take on the responsibility. Why I point out that uh, this point is that many a time in our country, in the, especially in the smaller cities, the authorities are very happy giving the responsibility to the householder saying that, okay, if he can manage on his own, he can have his own septic tank system or a twin pit system. We do not want to take responsibility of the public, uh, uh, these uh, um, treatment facilities. However, this is one of the major uh, responsibilities of any public authority is to uh, make sure that the sanitation, because it's not our individual, one, one person's poor sanitation also affects the neighborhood. So you cannot allow, or you cannot just leave it to that uh, person to take uh, care of sanitation because it is also affecting the neighbors. So out here, once you have this uh, public sewer systems, they have to be maintained with the public authority. And in case, you know, like any system, they are prone to disruption if they're not managed efficiently and that can bring a bad name. So that kind of gives a small, uh, you could say amount of, uh, there's a resistance in many small public uh, bodies, uh, small towns, that they do not uh, feel that they uh, should take up the uh, this offsite systems, right? Second concern, obviously, is with the uh, the cost. One is you know uh, the cost of uh, water wastage. These are the general concerns. They say that to make the uh, make the uh, make the uh, or the excreta flow in the sewers, it takes out precious water. Uh, it's expensive to execute the sewers, especially. And so this becomes this becomes the second concern and third concern is seen in some parts of the country where they say that it is very inconvenient because the excavation will be there, digging will be there, the public feels inconvenience. So we will not like to take on this system. But in the other parts of the country where the progressive cities are there and the larger cities definitely without, uh, you know, despite the inconvenience, obviously there will be some inconvenience, deeper uh, people. Uh, uh, happy in getting the, these permanent uh, solutions that is uh, through sewers in case their waste can be managed. Uh, now the wastage part is uh, actually a not a, the, this concern that the water is wasted. That is not exactly a you know, correct concern because we are only using the excreta, uh, the black water or the water which you use in your toilets and all, only to convey the excreta past the uh, water seal in your uh, in your system. And once they have done that. Uh, you know, the, that is not too much of a concern as your black water usage is only around 25%, while your other usage is of 75% for your kitchen and others. This entire water has to be brought in from whatever distance it is. So, to get a good quality of, uh, uh, you could say, life, if this 25% additional water is there, because it is also being used in, uh, you know, clear cleansing and also for clean making the toilet uh, bowl and other areas clean. So, we cannot generally say that this water is being uh, wasted as such, right? 
Second big advantage of this system, if you have an offsite system through sewer and STP, is that entire water which is you know used by you can be conveyed to a good treatment plant where it is polished and it is you know reintroduced into the environment for reuse. So which is not possible through any other system. It is expensive to maintain and to execute and maintain. That is a that's a claim. But uh, as compared to any of the other uh, public services which our municipality provides, be it water supply, be it uh, road transportation, street electrification, uh, it is much less uh, expensive to execute and maintain a sewer network or a sewer treatment plant. So if you have to live in an urban environment, if you have to live in an improved urban environment, so this excuse or this claim could be uh, should not be made right okay second alternative which we generally take on in this country and where almost 50 to 60 percent of our urban areas they have this on-site management system most of it is based on septic tank system so there are certain minor alternatives but typically this uh, septic tank system is there which is actually a passive engineered system which should have a two-step process uh, there's a septic tank and then there's a stoke pit. So uh, there's a bit of uh, you know science behind it, but the actual treatment takes place in the soak pit and septic tank is just a holding tank which separates out the various components of the uh, pollution, pollution. So uh, we find that in uh, uh, you know this septic tank, all these definitions, I'll uh, just leave the presentation. So, uh, uh, Okay, out here I just wanted to point out that the aim of septic tank is that uh, the surrounding soil can take care of the other uh, silage water if possible, if there is adequate surrounding soil, because there's a certain uh, percolation rate which the soil can uh, take on. So you, it's not uh, unlimited. So if uh, the, that water can be absorbed by the surrounding soil, so we can discharge the silage water because it has a less percentage of uh, you could say uh, the pathogens, though it has got a higher percentage of uh, BOD, but pathogens are less, so it can be uh, left out in gardens and grass areas. This is given the IS code. But at the same time, we have to note that in urban areas, because of the high congestion, there are a very limited amount of gardens and grass areas. So we cannot just take uh, you know this uh, at the face value. We have to plan for this. So planning also is dependent on the kind of uh, concentration of public in a, in a given urban environment. Uh, under no circumstances should effluent from septic tank be allowed into an open channel drain or a body. In most of our cities, in 80% after the septic tanks have been, are there, the septic tank effluent always uh, comes out into the, on the, onto the surface and very few soak wells have been provided after septic tanks in most of the cases, and especially in smaller towns we find that septic tank discharge is often released into the open channel surface drains, which are not actually meant for uh, surface. Uh, so these are the uh, you know points which are uh, I've just highlighted from the IS code, but uh, still uh, these uh, practices are in uh, uh, their country. Like I was already telling you that, you know, most of the treatment, if you see as per the US EPA, 75 to 90% of the uh, BOD and suspended solids can be removed and uh, Variable quantity of bacteria can also be removed through a septic tank soak well systems, provided that there's a soak pit after the septic tank. By itself, the septic tank is very, very poor in removing the BOD or the or the bacteria component, which is the uh, major uh, uh, problems which we have. So this is very important. Just by allowing a person or a private householder to make his own septic tank out a soak pit and we uh, turning a blind eye to this will not be adequate. And that is the second reason that the public authority has to make sure that either these two systems are uh, in you know, existence in tandem or we have a uh, collection system through a sewer collection and take it to a treatment plant. So, uh, okay, I was already here. Then uh, there's a problem with the soap pit says that it requires a lot of space. You know, we, we have tried to calculate that in Indian circumstances and Indian soil condition, around 26 to 35 meters of uh, square meters of area would be required per urban household. And in many urban areas, especially in the poor area, poor uh, surroundings, it is not uh, possible to find this kind of a uh, space to make a soap pit because you cannot construct 
too much uh, on, on top of a soap plate. It has to be, uh, you could say, uh, the land cannot be put under pressure. So this is very important to note that in many areas, uh, this kind of uh, uh, space may not, a footprint may not be available to make a proper soap plate. On the other hand, in many of the western, uh, sorry, on the eastern belt of our country, the groundwater table is uh, in the, is in between the range of two meters to five meters, especially in the coastal eastern areas. And uh, the soak well at its after its bottom, the soak well should have at least a percolation uh, space of around 1.5 to two meters as per norms. So often, what happens if this uh, uh, you could say gap is not available, the soak well water percolates into the uh, subsurface groundwater, and that becomes the very very important. Uh, uh, element of pollution. Uh, we have found through our various studies that in India at least 80% of soil septic tanks do not have a soap well arrangement. Especially, also, especially those have been constructed recently under the Swachh Bharat mission because it was a five-year mission in which funds were for this, but because the time was, it was a time-bound kind of a thing, people have gone ahead and made a large number of septic tanks, but they have not bothered to construct soap wells along with it. So what is actually happening that if the septic tank does not have a soak well, the affluent of the septic tank comes back onto the surface. So whatever black water or the, uh, you could say, excreta linked water, which you were thinking this be lost into the septic tank, also finds its way back to the uh, surface and it flows in our surface drains. Okay. These are some elements which uh, I have taken from the CPHO manual, which uh, we follow in this country. Some important things are highlighted in red. One is that in case you have a septic tank kind of a system, it says that it's an interim measure till a decentralized or a full sewage system is implemented. So it's often in small towns, we or in, even in median towns in this country, we are of the opinion that we can do with the septic tank and the soak well system. But no, an on-site system is only meant for a certain density or a certain uh, uh, moment of time in the uh, in the growth of an urban uh, environment and as an interim measure and ultimately we have to make sure that there's a decentralized or a full centralized system as required is brought into the uh, system uh, one important criteria which has been or a point which has been listed in our manual is that when this system is applied to an urban area with high population density care must be taken not to have a negative effect on the surrounding environment and this is invariably the biggest problem with our, uh, you know, septic tax or on-site system that we have to make sure we do not bother with this. What is that high population density? I would like to take you back to that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, London wala uh, example, which we said that Bond Street wala. At that time, London had a population density of 4,000 per square kilometer. So with that density, once the pollution was... Uh, or the or the pathogens they get into the get from the uh, usage of used water that uh, those pathogens went into the environment into the subsurface water which was drawn by the people for their uh, uh, water usage so at 4000 density it was felt to be enough and it caused a massive cholera outbreak in that country so out here also that risk will always be there if we do not take care of you know how this water is actually uh, untreated water is getting into the uh, into the subsurface water next uh, some of the criteria for site selection of a septic tank system is you know it also has to be this has been taken from malaysia but was also applicable for our country and our manual is also covering some of the points but it has to be uh, you know at least a certain distance 15 meters away from any underground water storage tank so in in smaller towns where there's a lot of water storage or a open well system so we must make sure that all these uh, uh, septic tanks are not too found not too close from such uh, uh, structures and uh, you know, definitely these are not very good in case we can also have a similar system in our local bylaws for septic tank systems so that these sludging vehicles can at least approach up to that uh, close to the household and uh, uh, such other advantages which can be taken from these uh, uh, norms. Uh, right. So next, uh, so ultimately, if we if we try to compare what are the pros and cons of on-site system, off-site systems, we have just tried to 
put it on a single slide out here. An on-site system definitely has got advantage. It is less cost intensive to the municipal body, but it is actually very costly on a per capita basis because this individual or the householder has to uh, make uh, this arrangement for his own septic tank and a soap well system where he may not have a space in, uh, available to him. And if he does not have a space, he compromises it and that compromise affects the neighbors and the other public uh, in the in the urban area right second uh, advantage of having an on-site system is that we can control the entire treatment system which can be then made sure that the water is available for secondary usages so it's a complete uh, solution uh, then uh, like i said the cost of septic tanks which the householder otherwise has to bear can be taken up by the uh, by the public authority and the householder can be charged a monthly rent or a uh, revenue for this uh, service right a, a disadvantage definitely the discomfort there for at the time of implementation but once these systems are implemented and it has been done in most of the developed nations after that systems are implemented they are less discomforting so um, this is one a disadvantage of black of only having a septic tank it's an incomplete solution like we said Firstly, it only deals with black water, and in case the soap well is not there, even the black water comes to comes back to the surface. So it is difficult to monitor and manage. Uh, also, the system needs to be desludged periodically from the household itself, which would be very difficult in congested urban areas in many cases. Sir, uh, so maybe request you to kindly wrap up. Yes. So last, uh, I can I can just wrap up out here. So what we were also thinking was this is a very nice. Uh, table uh, which has been uh, made by one uh, professor Yashwiki from University of Queensland. So it has done based on the population density basis, it says what would be the most appropriate treatment systems. So on-site systems, as you say, can see where the population density is less and where the availability of electricity and water supply is less. So these kind of systems can be uh, useful out there where the population density is also less and the water supply is also less. But in an urban environment where we are providing adequate water supply, so we should try to go for uh, these systems which are full fledged treatment systems. So conventional sewerage in case the population density is high and in case the population density is low, something like an on-site treatment plant like a Jakasu kind of a system. So these, these systems are, uh, you could say, uh, useful uh, in case of a uh, urban environment after after a certain threshold density. So my next few slides were meant to discuss how this density approach has been, uh, you could say, um, taken into consideration. But I'll just uh, uh, I'll just discuss. Uh, we have we in the in the other slides you can just take this. Uh, we have discussed from USA and Japan, but we take a example of Malaysia. So we take the example of Malaysia being a you could say um, developing nation to an extent so they have a system that on if you have a single development where the density is more than five units per hectare you will have to provide a sewer network but if the density is less than five units that is this is less than 25 people per hectare you can have a on-site system right so uh, as you can see but even once that if the density is low but the number of units is large for a single development which has more than 30 units but density may be less, a sewer reticulation system is preferred. So if the density is low, you can do with the on-site system. Still, they prefer, uh, in case the number of units is large, to have a uh, proper sewer, sewer uh, reticulation and a treatment plant system. But definitely, whether ter terrain is a dictating factor, if the uh, terrain uh, so requires that you know this networking cannot be done, then we can have a low density. Uh, system. So this is a good, uh, you could say, practice, which in our uh, Swachh Bharat mission, we also try to follow this. Uh, at the end, I'll uh, you know just say that uh, we have to find, each city will have to find what is the availability of funds which you have as against the population density, and you have to find your own inflection point, which is that point at which you will think that we have to have a uh, network-based system vis-a-vis -vis the on-site uh, system. In our country, in Swachh Bharat Mission, what we are trying to say, where the population density exceeds around 6,000 people per square kilometer, you should start looking into a network-based system once, even if it's a part of your town. So in case of our class two town, which has got a population density of typically in our class two town, which has a population of less than one lakh, 
100,000 in our country. The population density is generally around 3,500 persons per square kilometer. So for that population density, a certain core area, we have the more, if it's a core area which is more densely populated than the fringe area of the town, in those areas you should start developing the uh, reticulation system and an off-site system. But for the fringe areas, you can continue to do with the on-site system. Some of the documents and the design guidelines which we have uh, following in this country, I'm just uh, you know putting it uh, on screen. Um, the manual on sewerage and sewage treatment, that's a, that's a Bible uh, which we follow. Recently, under Swachh Bharat Mission, a small, you could say, summary of this has been made into a document, into an advisory by this uh, CPHO, which is known as on-site and off-site sewage management practices. An advisory has been published. And uh, definitely there is a portfolio practice for septic tanks, part one and part two. So this needs to be followed. Many of the cities are not following this. So we under Swachh Bharat Mission, we are also guiding the cities that you need to uh, make sure your bylaws have uh, this, this uh, well uh, uh, written into them that people have to follow the uh, on-site, uh, uh, sorry, on this code of practice of the ISCO. Uh, some other documents which have come up from uh, our uh, organization, the CPHO, in recent years are as given on this, uh, this slide. There was a discussion to be had on the uh, role of vehicle septage management, uh, but I leave it for now. It's just to say that there are there's an advantage of having a vehicle septage management, but there's a bigger advantage of having a need-based uh, system in which the vehicle septage management and the sewage treatment they can be uh, uh, in a in a synergic manner through a co-treatment process uh, should be introduced, right? So uh, next point was about the, uh, you could say, what we are actually doing in this country for smaller towns, what is our policy for the smaller towns, but I'll cover it from some other town or you can take the presentation and you can, uh, you can, you can take it from here. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, time and patience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Rogans. Thank you so much for that. But there are a few questions in the chat box I would uh, read out for you if you could address them. Yes. There was one question that you know, in your very initial slide had a abbreviated term of CONHSP. I mean, there's a question like what, what would, it, would it expand to? CONHSP is carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, phosphorus and sulfur, which are the basic components of which get introduced by into... See, we have a H2O, which is a pristine water, which was supplied to you in the morning. It was supplied after treatment to you for your use. You used it through your kitchen or through your toilets or through your washing. So these are the various chemicals which have been introduced by just one single usage and which have to be again removed from the water. So this is what CNHSP. Yeah. So, and then again, when you are talking about the code of practices, especially the soap pit and all, there's a question from one of our participants in Bangladesh. What should be done for higher groundwater table areas if soak pit is not allowed? Any so horizontal soak flow, drain, or what would you suggest yes. in that case? If we, in India, we have this IS 2470 part two, which deals with the second unit. One is that in case you uh, percolation rate permits and the groundwater permits, you can have a soak pit and that design is based on the percolation rate. The second system, which it, it says is called a mound system, in which what you do is you make a over the ground filling of earth is there. So, and you leave the water at the slightly higher level so that it does not actually get into the water level. So you make a two meters or higher mound on your property and you leave the water at that height so that it percolates only through the mound and does not touch the water table. Third introduction, which has been given in the IS code is called the uh, anaerobic baffled uh, filter system. So it's a anaerobic uh, filter is just a tank, small tank, which has got a, uh, uh, you know, it is also like a septic, but it has got a much more time, residence time in this, where anaerobic activity is allowed to take place and that uh, it becomes a filter. And then the, after the filter, the water actually rises up and uh, it after treatment, it it's introduced into the environment or into the Nali after, after because it cannot be allowed to go down. So it because of the high water table, it gets introduced. So this, these three are there and one more system is there in this. So anybody who wants to have a look at the IS 2470 part two, he can uh, you know download and have a look. Sure, sure. And related to that same soak pit, there was one more question. If the soak pit area is around 70, 20, 17 to 25 square meters, which relates to the radius of more than 2.5 meters or six feet, 
is that feasible option at a household level that's what we are trying to tell you that so fits see uh, this is not what we are uh, introducing this is a formula for the percolation rate so depending on the percolation rate in case you have a sandy soil the requirement would be much less because sandy soil it is easy to percolate but what the soil found in india and bangladesh is basically clay and loam and such clay loam so these have got a very low infiltration rate as you can see it is 1 to 5 mm per hour the water does not infiltrate even on the initial time when you have just made the uh, you know that the soap pit for first few days it will be you know passing on faster but after some time the uh, the pores will get clogged so these are the norms of that particular soil and based on the formula the norm dictates that uh, the formula dictates that this is the amount of area which will be required if on a continuous daily basis one household is discharging say 500 liters five people 100 liters for this into the subsurface so if i have, if i have a 500 liters discharge to be managed i'll have to have this you could say area available because after all the soak well is actually nothing but a interface between the earth and and your water that has to have a uh, you could say uh, uh, surface area for, to get into contact so this is the surface area needed so this is as per the formula only uh thank you thank you so much that explains another question i would take the last question of this session and then i'll call up our next uh, uh, speaker there's a participant from uh, nepal he has asked what do you suggest in cities where already majority of the households have non sewer sanitation systems basically kind of a holding tank or a septic tank like so in our uh, country what we are doing under swachh bharat mission we are saying that in case your density is above 6000 or so you have to depending on the funds which are available to you if you don't have money nothing can be done about it so the money has to be made available and in case you have money you have to make sure that at this is the right time to get into a, a network system so if you are saying that we already have these holding tanks the network system can be two ways one can be the bypass way that you have a fresh network system and your toilets get connected to this network which is a or conventional sewer system and otherwise it could be that small bore system where after the you are holding tank the solids are settled in the holding tank or you can have a small bore system which is for the effluent which is escaping from the holding tank but in the second case the issue is that definitely advantage is that you do not have to excavate to the depth which a sewer uh, requires but at the second same time your septic tanks will be you know at a, after a certain period needing desludge so it has to be so you will be left with both the problems for the desludging also and also you have to actually make the sewer the sewer is almost the same only the depth is reduced so you may say save off on the short term but on the long term you will have to invest money thank you thank you so much sir that that really thank you so much stay on with us as in a continuation with the session of this designing on site sanitation systems uh i would ask mr kakkar to stay on with us and if there are any questions coming up in the chat box we uh, you can take it up while we call on our uh, next speaker for the day who would be speaking more mainly on a little bit of advanced uh, on site sanitation system which we prefer to call it as transformative technologies and that which promotes safe sanitation so uh, mr venkata is a senior program manager at bill and melinda gates foundation working at uh, new delhi i mean working from india in new delhi again and having i mean not wasting much of time i would hand over the scepter to uh, mr venkata over to you mr venkata take us through the transformative technologies thank you so much thank you very much uh, dr rajeshri uh, professor chari and the entire aski team for this wonderful course on cyz and of course uh, giving me a chance to talk about uh, what the foundation has been working on and of course uh, special thanks to uh, dr kakkar for uh, such an, a comprehensive presentation on uh, the multiple solutions the issues the challenges and so so on it makes my job both easy and tough it's easy because he has laid out all the scenarios and he has talked about so many important uh, parameters which actually led the foundation to start thinking about sanitation in a very profound manner so it is a natural progression of what i hopefully going to present now it's tough because he has uh, 
given such an inviting presentation, I'm not sure if I can match up and generate the interest, but I'll do my best. So with that disclaimer, I would like to get started. So just quickly before I go into the topic, the foundation has a brief history. The foundation, as may, many of you might be aware, has prioritized sanitation because we are primarily a public health foundation and uh, sanitation, water sanitation and hygiene obviously is very much an integral integral part of the uh, public health outcomes that uh, you know countries around the world will want to achieve. So in this context, uh, as is the DNA of our co-chairs, uh, Bill Gates, Melinda Gates, and so on, we believe technology is going to be a major driver in getting us to the goal of safe sanitation for all and improving uh, public health outcomes. So we launched certain challenges. You know, one of them was called the reinvent the toilet challenge. As uh, I think most of us know, the toilet uh, technology, the flush toilet system has been around for the last 150 years or so since Kramer invented it and hasn't gone undergone much of a change. Well, the back end has been undergoing so many uh, different uh, progressive changes, many of which were laid out by uh, Dr. Rohit Kakar. So I think the challenge was to really to look at on-site treatment, containment treatment. So nothing comes out of what actually the, um, you know, when people do their business, uh, then nothing comes out of the toilet. Everything is safe, what comes out. That is the ultimate vision with which the reinvent the toilet challenge was launched. We had multiple uh, uh, versions of it, one in China, then we had a challenge in India. And uh, then it has been ongoing working with some of the brilliant uh, technological minds globally. And then it led to a, a portfolio of products, which uh, I will briefly talk about uh, and why we believe this these would be transformative to sanitation. So I think uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the whole issue that we're trying to address, again, I will uh, take up a lot from the previous presentation. There are multiple ways in which sanitation services are offered, off-site, steward connections, on-site, and so on. And uh, one solution cannot serve all. I totally agree with Dr. Kaka the way he laid it out. And uh, as we started out understanding the sanitation scenario in multiple countries, of course, ASCII have been a frontal integral partner of this journey with us. So I think that they have, they have, uh, uh, they have a lot to contribute as well in this as much as our other partners is that the, the goal of sanitation is to ensure we reach the poorest and we achieve 100% coverage. Even if a few persons are left out, even if the last person is left out, the goal is not achieved. So that's how the construct of CY is really evolved. And uh, today it's such a strong uh, mechanism on which uh, sanitation uh, infrastructure uh, planning is happening. And as you can see in this image, which is very, very uh, you know common, I just want to draw on this, is that there is a whole sanitation value chain going from containment, emptying, transportation, treatment, and recycling. And the emptying transport might be replaced by sewer pipelines in the case of sewer networks, but ultimately you treat and you reuse. And the whole of this, uh, the goal is to shrink it within the first, uh, you know, the red box that you see on the left side. Essentially, that's the goal, which is on-grid safe sanitation that happens. You could think of it as miniature sewer uh, uh, STPs, you know, uh, from each uh, facilities with, let's say, a few dwelling units, 20, 20 homes, 100 homes, and so on to also you know, finally bring it down to each home uh, being thought of as a unit and you have an STP within the home. That's sort of the thinking so that, you know, the there is no harmful discharge coming out of any facility where people are, uh, uh, where human waste is generated. So that is the goal and the critical part. This will uh, eliminate the need for any kind of manual intervention and uh, for handling the human waste. And of course, uh, I agree that you know both the liquid and the solid part have to be taken into consideration. So fecal sludge management, used water management. So the technology that you know we have evolved. We started out with fecal sludge management, and then it has now gone to stages where it can be looked at as a holistic solution. And looking at black water only, grey water, and so on. I'll give a brief uh, on, on thought that as well. So, just one second, please. So uh, coming to what we have actually developed in terms of the uh, whole uh, technology portfolio. So we have three different technologies that are currently uh, that have been developed. Two of them are in very mature stages and one of them is still under the product uh, uh, validation stage, design validation. And we expect to see that uh, being rolled out on the field in the next 18 to 36 months. So uh, I'll actually start with the ultimate dream that we that the whole uh, reinvent the toilet challenges were uh, uh, placed on. This is the household uh, reinvented toilet where you know you could think of the toilet as some kind of an appliance like a washing machine, no need of a plumbing in, no need of plumbing out. 
you know whatever you actually uh, is generated there is treated the water is reused for cycling uh, for uh, flushing and you don't have anything coming out or coming in and maybe every few months once the treated solids which are completely pathogen free need to be removed and uh, disposed of so that is the ultimate vision which makes uh, sanitation uh, value chain completely shrunk into one piece of equipment and i we believe we'll be definitely get there over the next uh, year, year or uh, you know year two or three years but that's that's again a, a work in progress uh, and then the other on the other extreme we have what we call the omni processor which are essentially again meant to be uh, uh, for non sewer uh, sanitation or even if you think of sewer sanitation in stps where sludge is generated so you essentially need to find a way that the water treatment technologies are pretty mature. You have a, you know, the, the MBBRs, the ABRs are well understood. And then the solids also need to be treated to a level where they are completely free of pathogens. And there are a host of other uh, you know, parameters to consider by designing these uh, STPs or FSTPs, which would be land area uh, optimization. And also looking at the uh, time for treatment, the quality of treatment, the efficacy of treatment and so on. So the foundation's uh, investment into omniprocessor development, as the name suggests, was really to try and find a way to treat the solids with minimal area, minimal electricity, self-sustaining system that can be modular, that can be moved around, it can be done in uh, sizes, flexible sizes, starting from very small units of 5 KLD all the way up, scaling it up as per the need. So that uh, is the what the omniprocessor, and also as the name suggests, the larger omniprocessors can really work on uh, taking up uh, municipal solid waste and fecal sludge together, STP sewage sludge as well, so that they both can be combined and uh, lead to more energy neutral operations and so on. Now, in between the two, we have what we call the community scale reinvented toilet. Again, a very modular solution out of the factory. It can be installed anywhere. And we have these systems operating in India for the last 18 months or so. And these systems are really uh, are, you can think of them as, you know, both just black water treatment units as well as holistic black plus gray water. So think of them as miniature STP that you can place behind your community toilets, public toilets, residential communities schools, uh, institutional buildings, and so on. And the problem of sanitation is sorted within the boundary walls of the facility where the problem is emerging, right? So that, that is a community reinvented toilet. Again, it works on different principles, different physics, but these all comply to certain global treatment norms. And there are ISO standards as well, which have been developed. Uh, I think about 29, 30 countries are also signatories to that. So this kind of uh, community reinvented toilet is essentially meant to uh, you know, think of it as not just in miniature STP, but also a replacement for a septic tank because here it's completely treated to uh, meeting whatever the treatment norms are required, both in country as well as global treatment norms, so that the water can be reused for uh, flushing, cleaning the toilet, and gardening, and so on. And, the, and, and it's it's again a self-sustaining uh, model. And uh, I think taking up from the previous presentation, some of the large uh, population dense uh, urban areas sometimes also can struggle with uh, availability of water. I mean, you take cities like Bangalore or Chennai, and some of them. So some of them are water surplus cities, but some of them really are water, water scarce. And we see a huge value prop for these kind of systems, especially to try and reach the last mile, the poorest of the poor in the, in the urban settlements and so on. So these are three different uh, types of uh, topologies in which the technologies have been developed. And uh, moving on to the uh, whole, uh, I mean, just summarizing, it's they eliminate pathogens. They operate off grid you know, with uh, you know very minimal energy requirements. Water, of course, can be completely eliminated. You might have to just do a refill every six months to twelve months. It's easy to install and portable. So let's say you want to move a particular toilet facility to another place, or you have a very uh, dense gathering of people seasonally, like uh, tourist locations. Um, pilgrimages and so on. These can be moved around or the guards of rivers and so on. These offer the ideal solution. In terms of uh, life cycle cost, they will have uh, some of the lowest life cycle cost if you consider a 10, 15 year window. And they are very modular and they're right out of the factory. So once the, 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 the system is uh, established to be operating as per the efficiency and the treatment norms that it's supposed to operate to, these can be at scale supplied um, operated and maintained uh, with uh, with minimal uh, intervention and also they are very easy to scale like you want to do this across say thousand toilets at one stretch it, it comes out of a factory so that's that's how on gives a chance for industry development for for uh, local industry development and private sector to really participate 
and also to talk about uh, maybe some of the service models while the uh, the initial cost the capex might seem like it's higher for the uh, general populace there are different models that can be considered when you especially look at i mean i don't want to get into the economics of sewer and non sewer because both of them have their place in the sanitation infrastructure planning and i am not an expert there are many experts in this particular forum now uh, that understand this much much better but it can also be there are ways to think about this as well as you know governments or cities offering these solutions as a service on a pay as you use basis Uh, something to think about we are contemplating this in other geographies as well and uh, we are working closely with the wash innovation hub within aski to try and come up with different business models and this of course will be very closely worked with the uh, different government uh, bodies as we try and uh, bring this up to see what will be the best way to roll these solutions out because they really meet the goal of safe sanitation for all now uh, we have been doing this as a commitment to improve sanitation globally and as you can see they are again on the right side you see some indicative figures which we want to achieve and these are by no means the best estimates that you can actually achieve you know when you come to the indian context the chinese context and so on there are a lot of ways in which or i know the south asian broader south asian context there are a lot of ways in which cost optimization can be achieved so those figures can really be uh, further optimized but they are just an indicator for the technology developers upstream to really understand what kind of figures they should really be thinking about if they were to make this affordable for the larger population in uh, the the developing world so those are the driving uh, factors for them and uh, in terms of uh, the different processing this just to give you a brief of different players who have been involved in developing these technologies and uh, you know i'll be happy to share more information through wash innovation hub as well as key as we go through this so just again the different configurations that we can really think of so community toilet as you can see you know very brief pictorially it's it's talking about at a community level it can be four homes it can be 40 400 homes and uh, you know multiple uh, ways of uh, setting up this infrastructure so the whole thing can be treated household level of course it can be like different toilets within a home or maybe a group of three four homes want to have a single treatment unit so there is no there is sort of a a uh, converging area between the single household and community but the point is the that nothing changes in the front end for the user you know the user experience doesn't change we are not trying to do anything there it's just that the back end treatment is transformed so that it it makes uh, the job of both the user as well as the government easier and also saves money over a life cycle cost analysis and of course some standards and some of the uh, uh, opportunities this is just to give you a pictorial uh, view of what this looks like today and what this can really go to in terms of much smaller sizing and so on and this is you know again there are multiple configurations it could be only be a water alone the solids can be sent out solids can be separated and then minimal water reuse for flushing the rest of the water goes after the solids are separated to a central stp and you know, so on so multiple ways in which this can be designed so i just go over a few configurations which we believe we can just make this a uh, little bit easier so again this is thing as you can see on the right side and what this can actually replace so a truck coming in and doing the desludging of a septic tank you eliminate the need for a septic tank by having this so the economics in some cases if you talk about a proper septic tank versus this we don't see they are much off even today but again these numbers have to be validated and we're working closely with partners like aski but at this point in time we are hopeful or we feel motivated that replacing a septic tank by this in 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 situations where there is an alternate grey water treatment uh, can be considered as far as, far as the black water uh, rt is concerned uh, as you can see the difference there but we also have grey plus black water treatment as well as uh, dr kakkar uh, rightfully pointed it's not such something that we only really think of black water treatment as you know pathogen loaded you know there is grey water there is bod co the 70% of the water or even higher is gray water so holistic approach is really critical and add to that the need for treating the solids as well so nothing leaves the facility that is harmful so the whole thing can be set and constructed in this this particular manner and you will get rid of a lot of other infrastructure by bringing in this and different service delivery models can be uh, looked at uh, again this is just a the first set of units that have been put up we have systems in india in new delhi in 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 kolkata in chennai in ahmedabad and so on and these have been operating for a few months now and of course they will need uh, further optimization in terms of making them you know cost effective and uh, so on but the performance so far in the indian conditions in the user context that we have has been satisfactory has been good and we're constantly trying to improvise that 
uh, to offer the best sort of uh, most efficacious treatment. But the starting uh, has the beginning of this journey has been good, and we feel confident we can take this forward in a appropriate manner to take it to the the the, the public. Uh, in term, the next technology I'll touch briefly upon, and please stop me if there is, uh, you know, a want of time, uh, Dr. Rajeshree. So the Omni processor is again, it's a, it's a system. It, it, you can think of it as a solid treatment module. Uh, some of you might have attended the, some of the workshops that we've had on the Omni processor before. Uh, we've had uh, discussions both around the pyrolysis based as well as the combustion based Omni processor, which essentially uh, are you know, can be attached to any kind of an FSTP, the fecal sludge treatment plant, or you know, at a larger scale, STPs as well. You free up a lot of land that really goes into making these assets. And you also remove a lot of the eyesore that you see by some of the sludge sitting. STPs can be very much in urban areas, which are, you know, prime urban areas. You, we, we all have seen them in cities across uh, uh, across our countries. So basically, it, can, it offers that level of real-time treatment Climate resilience is one of the key factors for both the Omni processor as well as the reinvented toilet, because we see these days a lot of flooding, unexpected or expected, I would say, these days with the climate change happening. And a lot of the sewage, septage can really get into uh, the public through, you know, the rainwater washing them away, going into water bodies and, you know, multiple channels that exist. These solutions, what they do, they're resilient because they treat real time. And what comes out, if at all, out of the facility where treatment is happening is really treated waste. And uh, while it's not still good, but it's, it's, it's much safer because if this gets into water bodies or gets into the uh, environment, it's still not going to harm people because it's been treated to a great extent. And uh, this, uh, this, uh, this just talks about a little bit about the physics of the whole thing. So that's dewatering the sludge, then the sludge is dried and pyrolyzed. The water can go through a conventional water treatment system, and uh, it is it's it's the basic goal is to keep it energy neutral or minimal energy, and make sure that the, well, we get reusable outputs uh, effluents coming out of this, which adds value to the circular economy. And there's a lot of uh, studies around what all the biochar, how it can actually make uh, the soil uh, enrich the soil, and so on, have been well studied. So these are some of the advantages. I don't want to go into details, but you can just see uh, class A biosolids. It's very easy to set up because it's again factory made, modular, movable. You can see the picture over here. It's not something that is needs a drying bed or setup of anything. It's like containerized solutions that can be kept anywhere. So the flexibility is offered. So we have a few systems, Warangal, Narsapur, Y, and uh, more systems are planned as well. Uh, as, you know, as, as we are speaking in the next 12 months, we expect to see more of these systems. So that's a typical layout. As you can see, neatly laid out like a factory based uh, approach. And, uh, you know, it, it really avoids the need for drying beds and uh, so on. So this is the other one, larger Omni processor. I don't want to get into the details, but this is based on combustion and where you do co-treatment of municipal solid waste along with sludge, you know, co-located co with an STP or a municipal solid waste site. We use gasification. It generates electricity. It, it produces industry-grade distilled water and it generates bio-ash, which has... A uh, lot of uh, potential use cases in the uh, brick industries, cement industry, and so on. So there are multiple. And this has been well, uh, sort of successfully uh, done in uh, Senegal and Dakar, Dakar in Senegal, where we have a very large uh, omni processor operating for the last three years, and uh, the outputs of that system have been valorized, and uh, they they do generate revenue for the whole plant. And these are have to be better understood and studied. But as the as the, uh, the treatment journey is uh, evolving uh, month on month, year on year, I think we see a lot of potential for private sector to participate, for capital to flow in, and the development sector is also increasing their uh, participation, their commitment. So I think all of this augurs well as we try to understand how these systems can be self-sustaining. But there needs to be that initial one two years where we really get these systems. Uh, once they are evaluated, you know, as innovative solutions into into the uh, uh, the whole uh, process of getting them into the field, and uh, with the support of uh, multiple stakeholders, I think uh, they will they will scale up. Uh, as uh, and, and of course, uh, this is one of the uh, a few of the technologies. Any solution that meets this level of land optimization, modularity, pathogen kill, I think all of those will really augur well as we try to improve the sanitation infrastructure across the region. So this is what it looks like. I mean, it, it, it looks uh, uh, as complex or as, as simple as how we want to design it, but it takes care of the whole problem of MSW and sludge. 
within a very constrained space and uh, it's uh, it's got a very uh, organized sort of operating model where you have a proper sop and people operating it so i think that sort of brings in that level of uh, maybe corporatization or sophistication into this as well as simplicity because it's well understood and documented um yeah so i think that's that's pretty much what these are some of the configurations we are looking at again these are all like i said the configurations can be designed to uh, you know how the different segments different regions different states and cities of a country want to have it the user experience governs what the design will be in the back end but you could but that the the what we what is on offer is the design itself which is validated and an opportunity for companies in the region to take the design and then localize it uh, to to uh, multiple applications thank you very much thank you so much mr venkat uh, i guess there would be a lot of questions coming up but there is a small question in chat box from one of our nepal participants there's got a few questions rather i would take up one by one uh, the first question is what is the minimal cost of a uh, hrt and a crt that, that's that's uh, a, a very good question a very tough question i know like uh, aski have been very closely working with us so they also i see the smile on dr rajeshree's face so basically it's it again the hrt costing like i said it's design validated stage it has to go through a little bit more of iterations and then gets into a product that goes to the field in the next 18 to 36 months but uh, the target cost that we are looking at is somewhere that that would be 450 400 dollars or lower per unit of the hrt i'm just giving numbers which are driving forces for the upstream technology developers and this can again vary a lot based on what we want to do in the in the in, within the toilet do we want to have a complete holistic treatment we just want water reuse we want to treat the solids and so on so the hrt is probably very fluid at this point in time so i will not really be able to give numbers or guide but the goal is it has to be affordable there is no yeah. doubt about that and in terms of the crt again it depends on what the uh, uh volume the level of treatment and so on but what i can say is we have studied the jucaso system we have studied a few other on site systems and it isn't far off right so if you, if you think of it in the indian context maybe uh, you know a sing a 1 kld system could seem to be pretty expensive maybe coming anywhere between 5 to 10 lakhs but a 10 kld system doesn't go in, you know exponentially that way or you know just as a multiple it's rather going to be maybe twice of what i just said so between 10 to 20 lakhs and then as you go to 20 25 kld it just really matches up with any solution that treats the water effectively for reuse and also treats the solids and eliminates the need for desludging or uh, reduces the frequency tremendously so i think the cost would not be a challenge uh, especially in places where uh, you really have co you know constant problem of you know uh, very very frequent desludging and also you are looking at uh, a real problem where the solids could be a problem the water reuse is critical because water scarcity might be a challenge or availability of uh, infrastructure to take the used water out might be a challenge another question from uh, one of our bangladeshi participants is this is this, i mean this is a very valid question in some of some parts of the country you know in indian also in the context also is this technology feasible where electricity is not that frequent or there are frequent power cuts yeah i mean it's very very valid question and if you look at it the philosophy with which we are working on or the, the within our dna as we design this is to draw a parallel to rural microgrids as well so we understand that you know when you try to reach the uh, the last mile uh, consumers you know on you know very very poor urban settlements and so on there is always uh, going to be a question of availability of essential commodities like water electricity so these systems do operate off uh, solar and uh, off grid systems now the cost of this you know one could argue that adding this kind of electricity or powering requirement could uh, really increase it but then what we have seen is that with uh, the current uh, cost uh, of uh, solar systems as well as the cost curve expected we don't see this being a huge challenge especially if the goal is to offer sanitation services to those particular uh, uh, you know section of population and the surrounding constraints of trying to extend other infrastructure to reach that place if you look at the holistic costing we are pretty confident that this will definitely be 
better than what uh, what other alternatives could be offered other than of course no treatment right so i think in that context and most of the systems you see in what i've shown in, in pictures they do have a solar system that we consciously made it clear even if there's electricity available let's try to keep these green and that's what we have been doing thank you uh, there's a question from one of our african participants i would ask frank to put up the question because uh, i'm not very clear what he's exactly asking by seeing pathogen free ash i don't think uh, mr venkata spoke about ash so frank could you please put up your question i mean could you open your mic and put up your question frank are you okay. there yes yes i am here Okay, thank you. I don't know if you you are hearing me well. Yeah, I yeah, can we can hear you. Okay, my question is uh, just uh, I saw pathogen free ash, and I want you to know because uh, according to scientific rules and others, uh, it is said that uh, after something is burnt, until until we get ash, uh, all uh, the microorganisms and others will die. And uh, when I see pathogen free ash, uh, according to what I understand, maybe we have some kind of ash uh, that contains uh, maybe, uh, I mean, uh, microorganisms which, which can resist the fire. So I need clear more understanding about it. More clear, yes, clear understanding. Sure. So uh, I think, uh, I mean, I'm not an expert in this topic, so I will also request maybe Dr. Rajeshri and Professor Chari to weigh in, of course, Dr. Kakar as well, is that uh, when I spoke about, I think, bio ash as part of the combustion based omni processor, and that happens uh, again, a very limited supply of oxygen at around 600 degrees Celsius or so. And uh, it really meets the, as we have, we have studied and tested the uh, bio ash that comes out of this system. Uh, it, we have an operational system in Vadodara and one in the Rohingya camp in uh, Bangladesh at, at Cox Bazar. And uh, it, it operates, uh, I mean, it, it meets the standards that are as per the global norms for class A biosolids and beyond in terms of uh, elimination of pathogens. We didn't see any specific contamination, even we did gasification of municipal solid waste and uh, sludge from the nearby STP. And even the uh, emission norms, everything was met. You know, in fact, you see white smoke coming out of it and the smoke has been studied. We've done a two-foot audit. Uh, so I, I didn't see any specific challenges. We didn't see any specific uh, presence of contaminations or pathogens in that. Of course, once the ash is recovered, the way it is going to be handled and so on, where it is stored and that could again, you know, beat the purpose if it is done in an improper way, which can lead to maybe moisture getting in or, or so on. But here's where I would maybe request some of the experts to weigh in. But that's that's my... Yeah, uh, Mr. Kalka. Yeah, please. On this point, I'm quite uh, satisfied that in case it's an ash, the pathogens will not be contaminant. It could be any other contaminant because of the, you know, the, the how the, what was the content of, uh, you could say, uh, elements like heavy metals and others which could be there in a septic tank environment because you do not know what the person who was who's a owner of the septic tank has been using it for like in the indian context many septic tanks are receiving chromium and such other just from the uh, industry or uh, you could say uh, pharmaceutical based from uh, there are certain householders pharmaceutical so in case their septic tanks are desludged and taken to such a unit there could be a one odd occasional chance, maybe one in a uh, very low probability, but the pathogens definitely will not be there because at a certain temperature, pathogens uh, will not uh, exist, continue to exist. So this is my input for this point. But on the other hand side, I must also compliment this because recently I was also taken to see uh, by Acclime, there's some partners of yours, Acclime. Uh, yes, sir. So uh, they took me to uh, a place in... Uh, East Delhi, where they have set up similar plant, and uh, I was uh, quite uh, you know, impressed. And in fact, we got them back to our office, and we are now trying to get them into the the, the you know the government e marketplace so that this product is also introduced. There, but we do not we are not very much aware what is actually happening with the validation because you were just discussing validation since uh, eighteen months period now. So it is there something which is still pending with you? 
So, uh, uh, Dr. Kakkar, that is for the single user unit. The one you saw in Kichidipur in Delhi is mature technology. It's there across the country, across the world, South Africa, everywhere. The one that I refer to as more validation is the single unit where it's like an appliance sitting in the restroom. One person uses it, it treats it there. But the one you saw is uh, well validated and it is in the field for a, long, for a while across the world. Okay, how many are there in India? Suppose we want to have any other validation. One is in Kichiripur and others. In India, we have seven units, uh, sir. So we have one in uh, uh, Kolkata. There's one in uh, that three in Chennai actually. GCC initially have asked us to sort of see if we can scale this up. The Greater Chennai Corporation. We have one at a public school in Ahmedabad and one that's recently got commissioned in Warangal. Uh, I think the ASCII team are aware of that as well. So, so ASCII is working with it and ASCII will be coming up with some kind of a, you know, report on this, what, whether, whatever norms are there are being met by this, this uh, system. Because on the other side, uh, as we saw, the one at Kichiripur, because this was a single unit, so we need to work on the what are the standards and what is the input to output, you know, ratios which uh, will be brought up by the, by the, uh, the, the agency which is setting up this um, plant. So because one unit at a particular scenario, certain kind of uh, input waste can give a X result. Whether it, this result will be replicated by another unit which has got a slightly different. So if you can just work on the, those norms, what are the what are the characteristics of the input required against which this will be the defined output. So if that those can be worked out, that will be very good because this is very, very impressive and we would like to, while the mission is on, we like to have this kind of a system because at this moment, we only have the Jakasu to say as an on-site full flood treatment plan. So if they, we can have a second uh, competition, in fact, I think the Jakasu people also on this, that there seems, seems to be something which will be very competitive product. So maybe we should uh, discuss this more uh, in depth. Uh, absolutely, yeah. sir. In fact, Dr. Roshan was also meaning to maybe have a word with you on that. He probably will you as well. And also just to add the differentiator, but also the but we can discuss more. Uh, just uh, to take the conversation a little bit backwards. Am I there? Am I audible? Am I like showing me internet yeah. connection is unstable? So just to take the conversation backwards, yes, uh, Mr. Rui Kakar, the one, the setup that has been, that has come up in Warangal is uh, ASCII is actually into the process of testing the input, input, the influent and the output parameters, whatever has been designed and claimed. That is something we will surely do it. Uh, then stepping back to the question of Frank and uh, the thing, I mean, it's better we call the output, the solid output, treated solid output, as biochar rather than calling it ash. The moment we call it ash, we actually mean some very inorganic components left behind. Am I right, Mr. Venkata? If we, yeah, so we then... call it biochar, when we call it biochar, we actually uh, we, we are actually meaning that the essential nutrient components are retained back. It is pathogen free. It, the nutrient components in terms of nitrogen, phosphorus, they are retained back so that, and of course, the biochar is very fluffy. It's much more uh, lighter in its density. There is a porosity in that, which actually can be used as a kind of a soil conditioner, which makes it more easily usable, reusable, or contributing to the circularity of the system. So that's how I would put it. And rather, I mean, it's like, it's not like interchangeably using ash and biochar rather we prefer to call it biochar rather than calling it ash ash is mainly some inorganic materials left behind after complete burning but what dr mr venkat said is pyrolysis it's burning them at a temperature which is devoid of oxygen or at in an oxygen tension environment which doesn't convert every other thing into gaseous form and left with minerals only but what is there is the nitrogen phosphorus all these which are good for the soil are retained back that's the product we actually get back as well uh, absolutely I, if i'm wrong Mr. no 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 you're totally right we, we use the term bio ash only for the gasification output exactly but, but for the pyrolysis and the crts the reinvented toilets it's biochar you're yeah. totally spot on yeah 
So any other questions? Any other questions uh, that could be taken up? We have, still have a few more minutes before we could wind up the session. If not, I will thank you, Mr. Rohit and Mr. Venkat for joining in and uh, sharing your talk. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And